I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design, with a conversation about adapting to the ever-changing design environment in which we all find ourselves. Since, well, the only thing that's changed is everything. <laughs> When I say that, I mean it. Everything has changed in the business. I remember last March when everyone I was speaking with, myself included, thought that the events would come back last fall and that the supply chain would return to normal and that everything, that we would just get back to business. As time went on, we all started to slowly realize that things were not going back to normal quickly, if at all. That being said, not all change is bad. The following conversation includes designers Shiri Dolgan of ASD Interiors, Michelle Saul Smith of Studio Surface, and Jason Lai of L2 Interiors. The panel explores the changes in the design and architecture industry in real time with a focus on adapting to these changes and maximizing new business and revenue growth. <sighs> change is hard. The unknown is uncomfortable. This exploration unearths some of the most challenging issues we're facing as it relates to the business and how these three firms are addressing these issues. Many of these issues revolve around specifying product right now as the supply chains are stretched, demand has grown, and inventories drop. This has led to both shortages and increased costs. These challenges now include managing the disappointment of clients and products not being available, making reselects, these increasing costs, the lack of manufacturer response times, and products showing differently online from how they really look. In this episode, you will not only hear the challenges restated, you'll also hear solutions to many of the issues every designer faces now and what the issues might look like in the near future. The best way to overcome challenges is to envision and plan for them in the future. This is another episode of the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series presented by Thermosol, featuring Michelle Salt-Smith, Jason Lai, and Sherry Dolgan. Are you subscribing to the podcast? If not, please do, so you get every episode automatically when they're published. You can find Convo by Design everywhere you find your favorite podcasts, and now you can find us on designnetwork.org, a destination dedicated to podcasts, all things design and architecture, so make sure you check it out. And when it comes to working with a partner who has your back, knows your challenges, and is there for you every step of the way, Convo by Design is presented by Walker Zanger a fantastic company and an equally fantastic design partner. While the Walker Zanger brand was built on the promise to inspire designers and architects to do their best work, there's far more to it than that. Yes, that promise is fulfilled every day through a commitment to provide the best ceramic, glass, stone, porcelain, and concrete surfaces and finishes. But at the heart is a family-owned and operated business that provides stunning surfaces for a well-designed home and does it to make designers and architects do their best work for their clients. Walker Zanger started in 1952, and they are absolutely one of the best trade partners a designer can have. Check out their newest collaborative line with designer Pieta Donovan, a, a collection of cement and ceramic tiles inspired by the patterns and colorways of the 1970s and created with a comfortable modernity. Walker Zanger is on the cutting edge of design, featuring products for every style and architectural feel you can create. And they provide homeowners with the materials that dream kitchens and baths are made of. Check out any of their 14 showrooms across the country or shop online, walkerzanger.com. This is Convo by Design. This is the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series uh, presented by Thermosol. What I do want to do is give you a chance to introduce yourselves just to sort of set the table here. This year feels different as it relates to design and architecture. I think there, there are going to be some themes that we can all agree on, like use of your time, materials, sourcing, events, all of the things that your clients are asking for now. Many of them aren't new but they've been amplified to a great detail. So I'm really looking forward to diving in and specifically asking you to sort of break out your crystal ball a little bit and look at what's happening now and what that means uh, later on into the year. So 
I'm going to go, uh, it's funny, I'm going to go in order of the way I see you. So first for a brief introductions, I'm going to send it to Shiri and then after Shiri, Michelle, and then after Michelle, uh, Jason, you can wrap this up. So brief intro, uh, Shiri Dolgan. I'm Shiri Dolgan. I am the owner of ASD Interiors and uh, we are a design firm that does both commercial, residential, and we are in business for almost 16 years now um, here in Los Angeles. And the range of things that we do uh, residentially are a lot of new construction, a lot of remodel stuff, all the way through furnishing. And on the commercial side, in terms of things like offices and stuff, we do them, but we do a lot of multifamily. A huge part of our business is multifamily. Um, and, you know, the whole range of, of things that fall into those two categories. Perfect. Michelle. I'm Michelle Sawsmith, and I own a design firm named Studio Surface down in Del Mar, California. We've been in business for roughly 12 years. We do primarily high-end residential. We do a little bit of commercial, some mixed use, some multifamily, but I would say a good, a good chunk of our projects would be residential projects, both in the area and across the country. Jason. Hi, my name is Jason Lai. Um, I'm the owner of L2 Interiors in Santa Monica. I've uh, been in business for 10 years now. Uh, we predominantly just do residential design, uh, single family as builds um, from brand new to the studs to just furnishing. Um, well, not just furnishing, you know, you know what I mean. Um, uh, I am all about design and I love to make things pretty and functional at the same time. My company is really focused on not just finishes, but the functionality of the layout and using every square footage um, and gaining that space for the client to use. Thank you. Um, so listen, we, you and I, all of you and I have all spoken at numerous times. So you kind of you kind of get my, my deal. You know what I'm all about. This is not a and a this is a conversation. Um, what I really wanted to do is kind of explore a couple of different ideas. You know, so Shiri, you and I met in a showroom doing an interview. Michelle, the last time you and I saw each other was at Modernism Week in, in Palm Springs. Jason, you and I first met at the Pasadena Showcase House for the Arts. Clearly, we're not doing things in person um, and, and haven't yet. I'm curious, how has that changed the way that you work considering no K-Biz, no Salone da Mobile, no West Edge Design Fair, I, no events, no High Point. I mean, High Point sort of, but not really. Um, so I, I'm just curious. And what I'll do is, I'll, you know, Jason, we'll go back the other way, Jason. I'll, I'll start with you, sort of throw it out to you. But this is a discussion. It's, it's not a Q&A. So if you got something to say, just feel free to, to jump in. I mean, it's been, <laughs> I wouldn't say it would be like an auto automatic struggle for us. I've done a lot of clients now that are predominantly just through Zoom. Like I haven't even met them. I've met them through Zoom. I do all my process through Zoom. And then when I install, I don't see them. So there's a few clients that I've done so far that I've never even met in person, which is like a weird kind of, it's awkward, you know, because all about this business is about personal and, and, and customer service. And that's kind of missing in the link. Um, in terms of industry wise, like, of course, I miss the events, I miss like drinking bubbles with all of my design friends and, and, you know, and kikiing and having a great time and stuff and looking at furniture and getting inspired by looking at new furniture and finishes and stuff. And we just don't have that now. But I think it's time to like really dig deep and just kind of like, create something new for yourself that you have really thought of your own instead of getting inspiration from others. What I've also noticed is, you know, I do a lot of furniture jobs and like lead times on like custom, custom and not only custom, but like furnishings through wholesale. It's just been such a pain in the butt. Like they would say the lead time one March before lead time was in August and then it's in December and then now it's May. So it's really giving us kind of like our clients are looking at us like, are you serious? You know, like, are you sure? Like, yeah, we're sure. Obviously we don't have control over it, but it makes us look really bad yeah. because we have to keep reaching out and say, Hey, by the way, I'm sorry. We're another six months behind because this yeah. care is not coming yet. And that's every 
like vendor that I've used. Every, every single vendor. one. Yeah. I think that's, that's such a key point. That's been the biggest challenge for me. I mean, you mentioned earlier, our business is so personal, whether we're face to face or not. And I think at least for myself, we get into the business because we are people pleasers. Not that that's always the greatest thing, but especially now, I think the biggest challenge for me is as a perfectionist and a people pleaser, managing disappointment across the board, you know, managing Mm -hmm. client disappointment, relaying to them the realness that's going on without sounding like we're making excuses, right? We know intellectually, it's not our responsibility. It's not our fault. But to consistently sound like we're not being honest or make an excuse of left or right is discouraging, right? Because we're always working to build trust with our clients, whether again, they're remote or next door. And so that's, that's been a big adjustment to just kind of come to terms with the fact that this is what's going on. We're going to keep you in the loop. And at the end of the day, it's first world problems, if we're honest, you know, yeah. so yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Sherry. That's, I think that's very true of what both of you said. And, and it's like a huge bummer not to be able to go and see stuff in person, but you kind of just have to make it work now. And so I spend a lot of my time just being upfront with the client, like, listen, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's what it is. Right. So we can either wait or we're just going to pick something else. And I think I find myself because I'm always like, all right, work smarter, not harder. Like, let's get it done. I'm like, listen, I know you really want this sofa, but here's three others that they say are in stock. And then I spend my time convincing them, like, I promise you as the designer, it's going to be all right if we go with this one because we want it done. And like, let's get it done. It's not the end of the world. And I'm telling you, it's okay. And those are the conversations that we have now. And I get these like, really? It's COVID again. I'm tired of that excuse. And I'm like, no, it really is. Yeah, right. I don't know yeah, what to tell you. And yeah. it's, and it's so, so far reaching. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's frustrating all around. I mean, but even COVID aside, we've always told our clients, you know, there's no such thing as cheap, fast and good. Correct. Right. And <laughs> it's been it's a too. really good exercise. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you get two maybe. <laughs> and now yeah. it's just, it's the wild west out here, right? You don't know what you're going to get. So I tell my clients it's either there or it's on its way. But, um, you well, know, I, mean, and I feel like also like the showrooms aren't really, I mean, it's not their fault either, but like not to put blame, but like, you know, I'm shopping at Durley and, and Pindler and, and Robert Allen, and, you know, like, but I can't even go into the showroom. And then the reps, unfortunately, not to speak bad of them when they ask me, you know, can I shop for you? Like, I know what I'm shopping and like, I'm waiting two weeks for you to send me fabric that I'm not going to even pick or look at because yeah. right. You well, know? I say that- is, So uh-huh. hang on one second, because mm-hmm. I, I think you, I think you pick up on something that's really, really interesting. And I, I kind of want to drill down on this a little bit. So a couple of things. First thing is COVID wasn't how this started. This started with tariffs. If you remember, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. two, two years oh, yeah. ago, two years ago, this started with the whole idea of tariffs and it changed, it changed our industry like overnight. Like basically there were hundred plus point increases in, mm-hmm. in pricing mm-hmm. on certain things. And it added weeks, if not months to delivery because it just put everything in turmoil, like right overnight. Right. That has never been, a, that's never really been accounted for. Um, because we went right from political turmoil into pandemic turmoil. So that was never uh, addressed. And then the, so I want your ideas on that. And then I also want um, your thoughts on, you know, Jason, you mentioned the showrooms. There seems to have been a lack of a coherent strategy on the part of the showrooms. Mm-hmm to adjust to this and adjust to what designer needs are to adjust to safe reopening to adjust and have their um to have their reps and sellers adapt in real time and so that they could help you do what you need to do is is that a true statement and if it is true why do you think that even after all this time adaptation hasn't taken place 
you know, you brought up the tariff. So we've been dealing with these delays for a while, but I think the difference now is there's the, um, there's no reliability. So it's not just about the pr price increase or lead time delays. There, I feel like there are no guidelines. You know, again, it's the wild west out here. We're, we're repeating information that we're getting from our vendors, showrooms, and reps to our clients, as inaccurate as that may be. That said, I do feel like the past several months have been a good exercise into creating a short list of vendors that have proven to be reliable, as reliable as they can in this environment to where there's sometimes no accountability and deciphering whether people are using COVID as an excuse or not. Um, I would say for the showrooms, there are some that I do feel are operating and have made adjustments to make sure that we're still getting the orders and we're still getting the attention that we need because it only behooves them. Um, but there have definitely been showrooms that I feel um, either they're waiting for things to go quote unquote back to normal, but the, the risk and the danger is they may not have the, the designers when things do quote go you know, back to normal because they haven't um, updated their standards or practices or employed other methods to make sure that in some sense that we're still getting the information and product and sampling that we need. I think that's very yeah. true. And I think we're also moving way too fast for them sometimes to right. keep up because the truth is if I'm specifying and I, I imagine this is true for all the designers here, which is like, Clients want to know today, is it in stock? If not, let's reselect. Like, like what are our choices? Let's, let's know today. So if a rep takes a day and a half to get back to me on the stock and availability, like I've already reselected something exactly. else. I can't use your stuff. Exactly. I got to know. Unfortunately, like it just is what it is. If right. I can text or email a sketch quickly to get approval fast, like I need to know right away, can I use this stuff? So they got to move as quickly as we are. Right. And it wasn't, it was an option then before when we can go in, like I said, mentioned before, we know what we're, what we want and what we're looking for in our head already. We just haven't seen it. And once we see it, we pull it and we can write them, we can ask them right away. But this process has just been so slow. Like they both said, like, you know, we have to go online, spend an extra hour, hour and a half scrolling through, you know, 75 pages worth of fabric on one color, you know, finish. And then and then it comes and then it's like nothing what you see because the online shows differently, just like when you're purchased anything online. So it's just kind of, it's more time consuming. I mean, thankfully I am billed through from by the hour, you know, but yeah. still, that's not yeah. fair to my clients when I can get it done in 30 minutes and, and I'm spending two and a half hours on it. Cause I'm scrolling, 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 you know, like it's just not good for our mental health. <laughs> you know, it may be a bit different. Well, I imagine it is quite a bit different in LA because you do have proximity to showrooms. So I will say that nothing has changed in Del Mar in terms of being very reliant upon our reps because I'm not going to run to LA every time I go to a showroom. Mm -hmm. And no offense to the showrooms that we have down here, but it's primarily fabrics. There are a couple of showrooms that are amazing that are multi-line um, showrooms. That said, it's always been the case for us designers in San Diego that we have to, we have had to be more creative with our relationships with our reps. And I will say in spite of, or because of COVID, we've had a lot that have always been rock stars and some that have really should like, I will call Holly Everett who reps Osborne Little and Designers Field. She will literally bring the fabric books to me within the hour, drop them off at my door. What are you looking for? She'll bring her whole, resource library if she has to. Same thing with Janelle. She's my outside sales rep for Needler for Share, which is one of my all-time favorite showrooms. She will drop what she's doing to make sure I have samples, call in the showroom, get that order processed. And um, so those type of sale reps have been immensely valuable beforehand, but even more so now. And I think they went, they realized that that is how you work and that's how the world is coming into, right? They're kind and of already accustomed to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I feel like a lot of the showrooms that we're dealing with now, even like wholesale vendors that sell furniture or even tile, like they're making an excuse, not excuse. I don't want to say that because we're all working from home. We are a little bit more lazy than normal. You know, I get it. But instead of being in the office before where I email and like I stock my emails and like they get back to me within five minutes and I get back with to them within 0.01 seconds, you know, so <laughs> right. 
And now it's like, you know, you just don't know where they are. And, 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 and for being in LA, even at the PDC, like a lot of the showrooms are closed. You can't even make appointments anymore. You can't right. go in. So it's been a, it's been a huge struggle. Like, you know, obviously we're all very creative people. We, 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 we figure out other ways, but you know, it's not, it's not easy for us. I'm curious in light of that, because you are as creative as you are. And I mean, look, let's, let's be honest as designers, you know, if something goes wrong, ultimately it's, it's you, you're the one that's, that's responsible for it. You're the one that's going to take responsibility for it and fix it. Um, and it, it almost, you know, something that I heard for the first time, I don't, you know, not to go too far into the weeds, but there was this story about um, cargo containers falling off ships. So in addition to the fact that you've got ships, you know, in every major port just completely backed up and they don't have the, the people to unload them. So you've got product sitting that's been specified, ordered, waiting for delivery, sitting in cargo containers, still on the water. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But then you've also got something. I didn't even realize that this was a thing that, sh that shipping containers will in rough seas just fall off boats. And if your sofa happened to be in that shipping container, your client's not getting it. So you have to reorder, you have to, you have to figure something else out. Um, I am curious what you're doing to sort of circumvent the, the traditional methods of working with your showrooms and working with your vendors and to try and get what you need. Also considering that you are so busy now, this is, this is going to be an absolute boom year for design and architecture. So knowing that a, you're busier, you don't have as much time. You've had to change everything about the way that you do it. Cause all of your vendors are changing the way that they do it. How, how have you adjusted? And and not to say, well, I'm just busier than ever and wow, it's really difficult. But I mean, what are you doing to compensate? We're doing a lot of custom, custom furniture because I feel that, well, in, in all scenarios um, and in, in any time that we're dealing with what's going on and, you know, out in the world, I feel like we have a lot of control. I have a lot of control when I'm doing custom furniture. We get exactly what we want. Um, we try not to shoot ourselves in the foot. We're selecting fabrics like, you know, Shalaya mentioned earlier that we know that potentially are in stock. Um, working closely with our workroom to ensure that they're very aware of what this is our, this is our ETA. And just having that communicate, if something shifts or changes, let me know. So I can get ahead of it to communicate to the client. Um, so that's helped us circumvent some of the headache. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier this past year, it's helped to create a short list of vendors that we feel have been reliable as much as they can. So in the current environment, so that's helped us by having that information at the onset, when we start specifying, when we're presenting to a client, we're presenting for the most part pieces and product that we know that we can get our hands on. But, but I would say even, even so, whenever I start a project with a client, whether it's the full turnkey from remodel to furniture, or it's just the furniture portion, I let them know up front, you need to anticipate minimum 12 to 16 weeks before we even see anything coming. So I think that helps manage the expectation. Does it always work? No. Um, but again, go back to there's no such thing as cheap, fast and good. Um, giving ourselves time to, you know, make reselections as needed. Um, goes a long way into minimizing the brain damage, if you will. Yeah, I think it's more for me, it's more constant reminder of the client. And, you know, we're starting, I'm having my girls like literally stock merchandise, even I don't trust the websites with their ETAs anymore. It's constantly going back to the showroom and asking them, are you sure? Are you sure it's here? Right. Can I get the tracking? And yeah. all that. And even now, even with my invoices all itemized, they they go in and put in what the ETA is yeah. on that line item. Yeah. And then I when I present, I just go, hey, listen, you know, I, I, the price looks amazing. You want to move forward with everything. Just make note, make sure you look at what the ETA is, because 
some of it is in May. And unfortunately, if you don't want to spend the money on custom, you're gonna wait for it. Right. But it also, it also brings us back, right? Because if the stuff were in stock, we can stage it, get a photo shoot, and then the next, and move on to the next client. Right. But now I'm seeing myself waiting and waiting and waiting for these things so I can finalize a project so I can like take a bigger project, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's just been hard and, you know, but we're very blessed. We're all very busy and everyone is wanting to do their home because they're sick of looking at their old stuff (laughs) Um, or they're saving so much money because they're not traveling or going shopping or anything like that. So they're pouring it into their home, which is great. Um, But it's just, we're, I'm seeing a backlog of, big, of clients that I could have been done like six months ago. We were just we're saying that, on. yeah, we were just saying that earlier that, you know, we're not going to turn down a lucrative project. Yeah. And when you, when we started some of these projects, anticipating that we we're going to wrap up much sooner, it, yeah, it creates a backlog. It creates a bottleneck to where now how, and I said to Josh, we're just going to make it work. I'm not going to say no to yeah. a lucrative, lucrative project because I'm yeah. still dealing with the straggler one. I'll figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, just be transparent and tell them, you know, like, yeah, there's maybe, a waiting list. Maybe there's a waiting list. Yeah, exactly. We're, yeah. We have like a waiting list now. And then our contract says it used to be like six to eight weeks to like two presentation after you sign, we, uh, we get a retainer. Right. Now it's 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah. And I tell them, you know, realistically is that timeline, but if I can get it faster, I will, but it just depends on what the schedule looks like. Yeah. I like the point that you made too. We had started doing this with one particular client, but then realized it really just needs to be a standard across the board. We're putting together our sales proposals, putting that ETA in there, or even beforehand, like you mentioned, we're doing the presentation and we show various options anyway. This yep. one costs this much and you can have it tomorrow. Yeah. This one costs a lot less, but you may not get it this year. Then they kind of own that decision. And there is no, like, you know, we we've, we've yeah. both are in agreement. This is what's going to happen. And exactly. it kind of helps minimize the multiple conversations that you have to have with that client about ETAs, you know? Yep. The other thing I've done, which I agree with everything you guys have said, but the other thing I've done in addition to that as crazy as this might sound is I actually send clients online to look at retail stuff. And I'm like, go look at those ETAs. Yeah. (laughs) They're just as long and they're lying to you. So exactly. And you don't have the pull with the online vendor that you do with your custom or your workroom. We ain't lying. The pottery barn barn does not give a blank about studio surface in Del Mar. (laughs) Businesses we may have done in the past, what apps, you know, yeah, like, inundated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know what I think it's going to happen because of the tariffs and because the increase of prices of even wholesale, I think the designer is going to be pushed into all customs yeah. you know, where everything has to be custom because that turns out to be less expensive than either right. waiting for a chair or like some of these, I've gotten so many emails this past month just saying like, oh, increase of pricing, increase of like mm-hmm. arteriors, the lighting place, I think increased. 40% or something like that. And well, I'm like, how, how are we, how are we as designers supposed to make money? You know, right. our whole thing is like getting the major discount, charging a purchasing fee, and then gaining that, you know, with the purchase of through the client. So are they taking away money from us? I think so. Yeah. So interesting. Um, gosh, that is so interesting that, that you, you bring that up because yeah, it, there, there is, there is a battle brewing and you know i think it's a matter of time at some point there's going to be kickback on a on a larger scale i will tell you one thing that has always surprised me is and you know asid does some great things um but i am i am surprised that there really is no sherry you're wondering where i'm going with this Um, (laughs) i'm like I want to know what great things go ahead. <laughs> well, but listen, you know, I, I think, I think they, you know, this, I don't need to even go down the, the rabbit hole. I think they, they do what they can um, to help promote. I think that, you know, COVID has exposed, the pandemic has exposed uh, a, a lot of groups that did well in, in the situation that was because, you know, they kept doing things the exact same way. And when the world turned on its head, and they couldn't do things the, the same way before they kind of got exposed. You know, I, I do think that they, they do some interesting connectivity things for people. I think there are some resources for new designers when they come out as a, it's a place for new designers to go. 
but it has always surprised me that there is no major lobbying arm. There is no major trade organization that lobbies on behalf of the creators. Um, in, you know, you have the manufacturers that all are, are part of, of groups, but there's still no major industry that represents the, the designers that allows you to have the, the power of voice, you know, when it's it comes like to almost right. Yeah. But here's, but here's where I think it's going, you know, and Jason, to your point, you, you are by nature creative people. And one of the things that has sort of been lost in this consumerization, you know, that we buy everything and we buy it new and, you know, flea markets coming back and, and work custom workrooms where you're doing things that are custom and then blending of the two, where going to a flea market or going to a garage sale and picking something that is just amazing and then taking it to your workroom where they can, you know, fix it, make it, make it work again, you know, bring it up to a certain level or keep the patina, but still, I mean, there are certain things that you can do. Um, and I think the create, it feels to me like the creativity uh, is coming back in a different way yeah. to the trade. And I'm curious if you're, if you're applying those same techniques, if you're seeing the same thing. I think so. I mean, I've always been one to not want to feel like a personal shopper for the client. And yes, we have access to, to the trade only vendors. However, I feel, and again, this is something that we've always employed, but I feel now more than ever that there is a big emphasis on sustainability and nostalgia and that our clients are choosing for vintage pieces and antiques and things that have provenance and patina um, sentimental value, you know, we've always preferred patina over gloss. I would much rather have this gorgeous vintage piece, whether I sourced it through first dibs or I sourced it through an estate sale here in Rancho Santa Fe. That to me speaks more about customized design to a client versus me doing a ton of shopping online. Yes, I have access to resources that they may not have. However, I think it points to our value that we're curating their space for them, that we're not simply just purchasing and adding items to our cart. So I think that um, that's been a big help and it's been a big boon to what our design philosophy has been. And then really the important part is connecting with a client that also sees that value and wants a piece again that has um, provenance to it, that has a story behind it versus something that Technically, theoretically, anyone could really obtain. I think, I think it really depends on that what's happened. that? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think there's also something that's gone on these last few months with people staying at home and like breaking the banana bread and like just being at home and making stuff like people kind of want this homegrown feel like maybe not a whole room of, you know, yard sale finds, but they do want a couple of things that feel like they've been passed down or they were right. found. Like it's the hunt is so exciting to have that one item that was found. And right. I see that more and more people are just interested in it now than they were in the last few years. Um, so it's like what Michelle was saying. It just seems like it's maybe more relevant now. Sure. I mean, there's definitely a difference. Like you said, like there's a difference between a great thrift store find and then straight up tweakered in. Right? <laughs> it was too much. Too There's much like a on the chair. Right. Still. <laughs> hey, yeah, no. Um, yeah, there's definitely like a caliber, I guess, of quality. And, um, but yeah, that's to say we're not above, you know, finding a $25 ottoman at consignment and putting a, you know, an amazing Pierre Frey fabric on it. So I think it's just, it's allowing us to be creative and be thoughtful. Um, but I, I agree. I think people are feeling more nostalgic, baking the banana bread. I was saying some, to something, to someone last week, like, don't underestimate the power of a good Midwest casserole. You know, <laughs> like, we're really craving that comfort right now. I think even to where we're going to see on a bigger scale, these big open floor plans, I feel like we're going to start getting away from the big, massive, great rooms. Um, you know, we're all in a climate where we really do value that indoor, outdoor living. So we've got the big cantina doors and such. But I think it's intuitive as people that we crave our own private spaces, especially after spending a year with our family members, like help us. Um, 
that people want to retire to their own quarters. So I think we're going to start seeing some more of that classic architecture come back where it's okay for the kitchen to be in the back. It doesn't have to be right as you come through the entry attached to the great room. So I think we might see some of that. I mean, look, at least that's my thought, you know, I've, at least with my clients, with the remodel, some of the new construction, not all of them are craving those big great room open spaces anymore. They want a master suite. Now the master suite might be huge. We are going to start doing, and we've seen a lot of this built-in wine bars, built-in coffee bars in our master suite. Like they don't even have to go downstairs and see their kids ever yeah. if they don't want to, you know, yeah. or their husband or spouse for that matter. So we're seeing a lot of those amenities that would normally be like regal just to the kitchen to like, I want a sandwich fridge next to my bed. Yeah. You know, and so. I also see now like the new clients that are coming in, they're more trusting on the designer, at least for myself, instead of, you know, them at work and talking to somebody that use another designer and getting their experience with that designer. I think people that are seriously reaching out to designers are doing their research on us, obviously. It's yeah. easy. Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, all that stuff, right? right? And, but now I feel like a lot of my new clients are coming in really are trustworthy where like I throw, throw out something and they actually are catching it and they are agreeing to it instead of before where I think there is too much going on You're watching way too much HGTV to like yeah. figure out what they actually want, you know, yeah. and the look of what they want as well. And that's like one of the hardest part of getting from a client is that they they don't really know what they want most of the time. And we we as designers have to get that out of them and create something for them. But to your point of view, 100%, I think people are realizing that their master bedroom and bathroom are e extremely important, especially if you have kids. Yeah. Um, a lot of more locks are being put up. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. A lot of like, you know, their own getaway. Yeah. Place, like where there's no kids, just them. Mm -hmm to just relax and chill out. And and like Michelle said, a lot of outdoor space, just they're just hungry for it. Yeah. Um, so can I, can I follow up on that a, a little bit? Um, because this is something I really wanted your opinion on as well. And it's, it's changing gears, but it's actually staying exactly what we're talking about. I'm curious what, what your clients are asking for now that is different maybe than what they were asking for on March 12th of last year or March 11th of last year, as opposed to March 14th of last year. Um, you know, specifically you talk about the, you know, the ability to go find one's personal retreat. I, I, I've noticed that sound baffling is more important now than ever before. Light is more important now than ever before clean water is on our minds like never before, but also it's more than that. It's the, the elevated activated uh, spaces, the, you know, we talk about steam showers, we talk about saunas, you know, we talk about the added amenities in the kitchens that make it more restaurant-like, that make it more spa-like in the bathroom, that make our environments more conducive to getting away because we haven't been able to get away. So I'm curious, what are you being asked for now um, and when it comes to wellness, where does that, where does that, that fall in both physical and mental? I mean, there's been a huge focus on health and well-being, obviously with what's going on and down to, you know, you mentioned the steam showers and we've been doing those for a while, but you know, chromotherapy and aromatherapy and just brighter colors, which is a hard stretch for me. I feel like people want joy. And it's amazing how color trends really follow like politics and what's going on in the world. Uh, we've been like really, really neutral, but I feel that we're being asked for earthier homey colors. Going back to what we talked about earlier, we're being asked to create things that maybe would not be typical. Like I mentioned, um, a true coffee bar, if you will, and the, the primary suite, not the master suite, I guess. Um, True outdoor kitchens. Josh, we talked about this a few weeks back. Not necessarily the builder's extension with the built-in barbecue and the stucco wall, but a true outdoor kitchen that would be just as appropriate on the interior. Um, pizza ovens and spas and cabana pool houses for guests. Those are things that 
not have never been important, but there's a more focus on them now. I mean, San Diego has even passed new laws where you can make an ADU out of almost anything because they're seeing yeah. they're seeing the pull for it. They're seeing the income that can be made from multifamily developers, homeowners. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that, you know, just kind of rethinking some of these spaces and what you would see in a primary bedroom versus what you would see in a kitchen that really there are no rules anymore for that. Yeah, I think like the like to your point, lots of outdoor kitchens and a lot of a lot more stackable folding sliding glass doors yeah. to really create that indoor outdoor real feel. You know, and, and the French doors are greater and everything now, but like my clients are hungry for the stackables that go right into yeah. the wall. Yeah. So like there is no transition. It's literally just inside and outside. Well, it increases their square footage, right? Exactly. Without having to add exactly. on, it's making those yeah. architectural changes. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you utilizing every square inch of their yeah. their homes, and now they're yeah. seeing that why make this fake wall when you can put a cabinet behind it or something like that, right. or behind could be a bar or something like that. Storage. And, yeah. And I think you know the clients now are willing to spend the money. Mm -hmm. for quality items where yeah. as before I feel like it's like whatever is cheapest whatever looks great I don't care if I get rid of it in five years kind of thing right it goes yeah. back to you know them wanting more sustainable things things that have mm -hmm. provenance and retain their value not mm -hmm. it's it's going away from fast design and fast mm -hmm. purchasing and, you know it's I think slow design, just like there's the slow food movement. There's a slow design movement now that mm -hmm. yes, people are incorporating trends, but to your point, I think it's more important to them that their purchases hold value. They're investing a ton of money and they want to see that, you know, over the course, whether it's mm -hmm. their forever home or not They're, Yeah, I agree. I think clients are seeing more importance and spending the money that they need to spend it on. Yeah. I totally approach every single presentation mm -hmm. or, you know, a consultation um, on seeing what the value we could add to the home so that it's a good resale value at the end. Like you, you, you just listen to me because even if you don't love it now, you're going to love it when I put it in. And then you're right. going to see how much value I've added when you do want to sell your home because it's not a forever home. I right. mean, listen, not everyone has a forever home. If someone's going to give you a hundred million dollars to yeah. move out, anybody will. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's only forever for so long. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know what? The other interesting thing I've seen a lot happening lately, too, in addition to these things, is everyone wants double of everything. So when we have the opportunity to build a master suite, they do want her closet and his closet and her bathroom and his bathroom and his her toilets. Yeah. Like, please give us two of everything. Yeah. That's <laughs> so funny. Even down to like water filtration. Water filtration at the main sink, water filtration over at the coffee bar, water filtration at the primary bath sinks. Yeah. You know, it's, it's multiples. You're exactly right. Yeah. A range with double wall ovens and a pizza oven and having anything and everything, if they can afford it, they want this, in, you know, encompassing resort and, style living, if you will. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of them are making the money because you know the clients that we have they obviously have jobs right and they're still working they're still gaining their paycheck but there's no more vacations there's no more eating out as much there's not mm -hmm. a lot of shopping you're not just randomly going to Beverly Hills and buying a new Gucci purse you know so they're mm -hmm. saving the money and they're actually putting it in towards their house so you know they're they're willing to spend the money now which is I mean it's great for us because it's gives us more options on everything. You know, it's funny that you bring that up. Um, not funny, but it's, it's interesting that it still goes back to what people value, right? Mm -hmm. People are going to spend their money on what they value. I can't tell you how many clients have said, I'm not going to spend a thousand or $1,500 on a, on a bar stool. But it's like, but you just dropped $180,000 on your car, on your car, right? <laughs> or maybe sell some of those handbags you got up in your closet. And we can yeah. afford the, you know, the $30,000 sectional. But you're exactly right. So some folks, whether it's been, you know, conscious or not, have shifted, I think, what they value because they've been forced to or they're starting to see what is important, which is family and home and well-being and health. So now that they recognize the value in that, the money's following. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's less, I think, negotiation on our part trying to convince them that, yes, it is important and valuable to spend money on your surroundings. Now they're kind of coming that to conclusion 
on their own as well. So in that aspect, I think it makes our jobs a little bit easier Mm -hmm. because we're not constantly arm wrestling them to spend the money. And of course that means not arbitrarily suggesting super expensive items because that might be what is available, but truly showing them the value and how it lines up with their new set of values and what they're willing to spend that money on. You know, what's really interesting. So it's, it's so fascinating to me because I can recall over the eight years that I've been doing this show, really for like the last four or five. And I think I've probably complained and whined to each of you at one, at any given time about, I'm so sick of talking about millennials. I am so tired of what do millennials want? What do they want in design? Uh, Jason, I can remember you and I had a conversation in the guest house at the Pasadena showcase house for the arts of this very same subject a couple of years ago. And we were talking about, millennials and the fact that in programming in programming for design you know everybody wants to know what do millennials want how do we design for millennials how do we how do we get them engaged how do we how do we work with them and i remember being so completely and utterly annoyed by the whole concept of millennials because dot 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 and now it's really fascinating to me that all of the things that we were talking about as it relates to millennials and the things that they wanted They didn't want to buy a whole house full of new. They wanted one signature piece with provenance and they wanted to be able to tell the story and they'll spend a lot of money on that one thing and then be eclectic and and highly mixed in how they would. And it was really annoying at the time, but here we are in in another time and place where circumstances have completely changed. And it turns out that the way millennials were viewing purchasing items, especially as it relates to design has all of a sudden come full circle. And now we're all kind of doing it. And I'm, am I completely off base, Sherry? Have you seen this too? Is, does this make any sense? Yeah, it does. But I also think the focus is off of millennials and I can only speak to the market that I see, but Yes, there are millennials who have an opinion and drive a lot of the trends and stuff, but the clients who are buying and selling still, even right now during the pandemic, aren't necessarily millennials. Right. So like my clientele isn't only millennial. Like, it's funny. I have a client right now. They're a developer that I work with and they, I built a home for them like five years ago and now they are downsizing because their three older children are going to college and they have one more at home. So they're taking another home and like, downsizing, (laughs) downsizing to like 4,000 square feet. (laughs) It's not a problem, first world problem, but you know, they're, they're taking into the opinion they're millennial and they're making the suite that their millennial will get specific for them. But like, they still want what they want. They want to live in a home that's comfortable for them with like what I'm saying, the kitchen, that's the way that they want the master bedroom suite that will have all the things that they want. So it's tricky. Like the, the trends might get driven a little bit by the millennials, but the money spenders aren't really that like it's an, it's an older demographic most of the time. Yeah, no, I was just saying that. It, and I, I totally agree with you. I don't think it's, it's that millennials are the ones who are doing the, the buying. Now, what I'm saying is it was that idea that they were espousing yeah. at the time that didn't make any sense to me. It was kind of like, it was so counterintuitive, like a a watch, a car, a nice suit, and a $40,000 armoire. You know, I mean, that's what they, the rest of it, they're eating ramen and they're, you know, they're a $30,000 a year millionaire, but they're, but they've got those four things and that's what they talk about. So I think that might be more about them being clever. Um, Perhaps you know, everyone wants to be unique, but then at the end of the day, it's like, we're all trying to be the same type of unique, you know, and yeah. no, nothing to minimize millennials or whatever. I didn't really know the age group, whatever millennial is, but, um, I think, yeah, I just, I just made the cut <laughs> I'm 30, I'm 36. So I, I'm like the old millennial, but gotcha. no, I, know, I know what you're saying, Josh, is it's that you, they, they were setting a trend, even though they couldn't afford it. And now the people with money is kind of following that trend. But I don't think that trend ever really were started by the millennials. I think millennials are selfish and that they really think about themselves, right? So like for, for me, you know, I used to live in Koreatown and I know in the Korean culture, they can live in um, a 1,000 square foot, one, one bedroom apartment and drive a $200,000 car. 
And that's kind of like the mentality of a millennial is where like they want, they buy one piece that's really, really cool and really expensive. And they'll post everything on their Instagram with that chair or that item or whatnot or whatever. It's just one way to prove to their friends or the public that, hey, I have the money to buy this chair and it's real and it's great and it's cool. But everything else could be shit, right? Instead of now the client now are looking at valuable things, but they still love the value. They still love the high end stuff, things that they couldn't spend. But I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Like millennials are selfish, you know, but we, we, you know, we like nice things, but we don't want to pay for the full value of it. But I think now with the pandemic, you know, the people, the older generation, you know, water is a huge issue because we drink a lot of it now because it's great for health and, and, and the interior home. So I think that's being driven to where they're staying at the most time since we're all stuck at home. So they're spending money that can make us feel good mentally and physically. I'm curious with the last few minutes that we have left, because I, I think that that is absolutely true. And I think that it's really interesting. You know, you mentioned something about social media and it was really interesting. And I know that you all noticed this as well. As soon as everything was shut down, you saw this transformation of social media from look at me and here I am and isn't this great and look where we went and look where we are and look what we're eating and look what we're doing and that all just like shut down and there was this this you could feel it right there was this backlash there was like oh my god all of my all of my social media friends and followers and fans they're all out there wondering what I'm doing, you know, nobody was wondering what no, you're doing, not. but yeah. nobody cares. No, they're nobody not. cares. Yeah. But <laughs> what happened is everyone started instantly talking more and, and putting more, you know, Insta- Instagramming live and, and putting more content out there and actually increasing the, the level of conversation. With that level of conversation, I saw so many new ideas start to, to come out and be espoused. And it was really kind of cool. And then now you can see as things begin to sort of loosen up a little bit we're kind of going back to look i snuck away and here's where i am and yep hawaii i'm at hawaii and like yeah I did, you know i'm at a waterfall and and i'm in my bikini and look at my my pandemic body and all yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all coming back and it's so all coming back. yeah so with that i'm curious i kind of want this is where the crystal ball thing comes into into play i'm curious um last few minutes that we have left to to sort of to know what you guys are thinking you know is there going to be another baby boom? And with that, how is how does that change design? With being at home as often as we were, people aren't going to go back to working five day a week jobs anymore. I believe that the home office is is definitely here to stay. And if it is, if a partial home classroom is here to stay, and I think we we can agree that it is, how is that going to change design? It's not a it's it's a zero sum game, right? If you take square footage from one place, you 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 got to, you know, if you want square footage and you need to put it somewhere, it's got to come from somewhere else. So what's going to change? What's new? What do you see happening? And this is really not like, what's the color of the year for the, for this year, you know, but what is fundamentally changing about the, the manner in which we design? I think one really interesting thing that I see has happened is that so many times when I start a new project, I hear the words coming out of the client's mouth and they're like, you know, when I entertain this and when my friends come over that and now like I I stop them. I used to stop them anyway because I was like, stop designing your house for the four parties a year you have. Like it's not (laughs) how you live. But now now it's like (laughs) you have to do it for you. Stop doing it for everybody. And I think that's the overall arching thing of like stop designing your home for the friend you're trying to impress. You have to stop. Yeah. And I think people get that now. And so they're really designing for what they need. Needs yeah. are very high on the list. Yeah. How they daily use their home because they're there all day. And then how to use the space. I think that's the overall thing that I see that's really big. Yeah. Functionality yeah. is a huge thing. Huge. And durability too. Since the kids are staying home, the furniture is getting used a lot more. So a lot of indoor outdoor fabrics are really popular now. Always. Sofa yeah. and stuff like that, you know. 
and and offices offices now they you know if both couples are home all the time they need to, they need to dedicated offices yeah they need a door and they need something that causes a sound or soundproof or whatnot you know I'm seeing I, I'm doing a lot of like dual things like what Sherry said before like dual bathrooms and yeah dual toilet rooms and stuff but also dual office space um, and I and I really do think you know going forward people when people are buying their new home they're going to look for that extra bedroom because they need home gym. for that extra, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For that extra space for them to work or get away and whatnot. And, and same thing with our office. We've been closed since March or we're all working from home. All my girls are working from home. And even when the world is back open, I think we're going to go back like two or three times a week because it has been working. And I only live five blocks away from my office, you know, but I'm fine with that. And it's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think in going back to, not these big open floor plans, you know, again, yeah, having openness and space to move around and enjoy, you know, family, all these different activities, but having those private spaces, the additional bedroom, whether it's for a second office or for a gym, um, which also goes back to health and well-being. I think we mentioned earlier that folks are really focusing on not just the Pelotons, but full outfitted gyms in an extra bedroom or wherever that may be. And um, multiple flex use spaces, you know, some folks may not have five or six bedrooms, you know, mm-hmm. and how can we make some of these spaces do double duty if needed um, and not scream office, not scream kids classroom. No parent wants to see their kids schoolwork sitting out all day. So, again, it's going back to having these private quarters where that kind of stuff can be out of view day in and day out. You want to hear something really funny that I recently came across, which I think happens every now and then. It happened, I know, when like Game of Thrones was really popular. But I also know that because (laughs) everyone is at home and watching Netflix and stuff all day, I literally see people like I know that they just finished Bridgerton and they're like, where's my sitting room? Like, I want to just sit and have tea or like random things like that because they're watching so much. So no, like, absolutely. Them. Where am I going to have my evening tea? No, yes, evening tea. Yeah. <laughs> Even more so, why they want high little rooms now? Like I'm telling you, parlors, start trends. Yeah. <laughs> we're not walking. We're going to promenade to yes. Starbucks. <laughs> but stuff like that affects it. I mean, yeah. everyone's no, absolutely. It's all it's poli- all political climate, the pandemic, culture. Yeah. It's all totally. Yeah, totally. yeah. And, and that's probably a good, good point of saying like where before as in everybody is trying to get good uh, or cheap fast and hurry and I need it now kind of thing where they're all watching HGTV now they're look they're watching Netflix and HBO and, and yeah. I think that has Thank value. God. Yeah. <laughs> right. Something that has value to you. Right. The, the last question I, I have for, for each of you because I've been thinking a lot about this and Sherry to your point um because what we're doing now, you know, clearly I am not back in the Convo by Design uh, design uh, lab that was at the LA Design Festival two years ago. I mean, I'm sitting in front of a hideous green screen. But <laughs> with that, you see, you can see beautiful images. But I, I think too, you know, this whole Zoom culture that that we've all been forced into and it's it's really interesting to say because you know sometimes you can you can talk about trends and we've all talked about trends and trending ideas and this is not just a local trend or a regional trend or a country trend it is a global trend Mm -hmm. and when there's a global trend like this it's not going away so with that i'm curious and i and i backpedal a little bit because um and jason i I was this past year was was the year that I was going to be working with the um, with the Pasadena Showcase House for the Arts myself. Last mm. year, I was going to team up with a designer. This is mm. really weird timing. Last year for the 2020 Show House, I was going to team up with a designer, take one of the weird, awkward spaces that they had in the in the house this year, and create the Convo by Design inspired media room. Mm-hmm. which basically, if you've seen what we did at, at West Edge or any of those, one of the walls was going to be green. It was going to be a nice shade of green. It wasn't going to be, you know, um, like that. You can see behind Green's me, it wasn't green. going to yeah. be like that. <laughs> but it wasn't going to be chroma key green, but it was going to be green enough that with proper lighting, and then there was going to be lighting worked into the room for 
for quasi-studio lighting that w- was actually going to serve as a potential home office, potentially homeschooling, if, if that was ever something. Um, and I was only doing it because I recently, you know, a couple of years ago, went back to school at Washington State University to get my degree, and I was taking virtual classes. And I was like, this is really cool. I could totally do something with this. I didn't even think that it was going to be real. Um, but the idea now of putting that home office, which is, which is elaborate, I'm curious how it's reshaped the manner in which you think about what's possible in design, not just a comfortable living space or not just a functional office, but a, an office that is multifunctional. You know, how has that changed? How has everything changed the, the manner in which you ideate what's possible? I mean, we have a client currently who the the couple, they're both CEOs. Of course, they're going to have home offices. But coincidentally and interestingly, one of the spouses, her company is about globalization. And it's about staffing companies around the world without physical offices. And they can get through a lot of what was previously a hurdles and political red tape. So now their business is booming because they've always have had this idea of how to create global businesses and satellite offices without having the physical structures and constraints and hiring employees around the country. That said, the technology that she requires is very sophisticated. It's, it's beyond the green screen. It's, it's the whole lighting. It's the AV um, consultant that we've had to bring in. Her husband, who also is a CEO of another tech type company, we converted the guest house casita into his office and it's soundproof doors that you would see in a bank vault and um, the way to do the different lighting and sound systems and the video production. It's really educating ourselves. Not, we don't have to be the experts, but then really knowing which experts that we need to consult to, but we've seen, you know, that's. The, you know, looking for the, the blue sky view, but even on a smaller scope, clients, like you mentioned, they're, or folks aren't going to be going back. And these large corporations are not going to spend the overhead to have a ton of employees. They're changing the office spaces. You know, um, we've had a client whose business had to purchase a rent uh, or purchase a new building because their current building setup would not allow for workers to be in the space. So it is far reaching, whether it's a large corporate client or it's a smaller residential client. It's really, I guess, doing the research and being knowledgeable of what is out there because it really, there is no limit. You know, so what is the limit? There is really, they can have everything from the subliminal to the sublime, you know, and it's just, it's insane what we've learned over the past few months, just trying to accommodate particular clients on what exists. I have a really interesting client also right now that is not exactly similar, but has a couple of um, similar to what you just said. So they're a developer that specifically buys property in LA in order to remodel them and build an ADU to then have two rentals on the property. And they own multiple properties all over LA. And they started doing this about five years ago. And it's a very specific product that we do for them. Like it's an easy build, really quick, trendy, whatever. But the two things that have come up in the last year and a half or so in order for them to get like the max um, rental that they can get and also to rent it very quickly are two things. One of them is when we do the belt out around where like the TV and the fireplace are, we now have to incorporate a desk space. So that way they can define an office because in these tiny little ADUs, or even if it's like a two bedroom house, something small, there isn't an extra bedroom that's let's say an office, but we have to build in and carve out a space that's an office. And then the other thing is there always has to be like two to three accent walls that these people can use as backdrops something trendy, something with a pattern, something that's a green wall that's like fake greenery, whatever. Like they want to know yeah. as, as you know, a lot of the stuff online now on social has become very raw, especially on TikTok. Like no one's looking for the pretty Instagram stuff, but right. they still need a backdrop and they need to change it every now and then or whatever. So like if their projects that they do provide those two elements, they know that they're going to rent it quickly and they can rent it for a lot more than a competing property in the same area. 
That's so like, smart. Those have to be available now, which never were an issue a couple of years ago. Yeah, before yeah. it was just an accent wall, typical multifamily. Now there's purpose behind that accent wall and, a, and marketing ploy. Yeah. 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 Kind of funny that you brought up TikTok because that was like the one thing that I was going to say. Being a millennial, I don't, I'm, I only watch TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but I do have a client that is TikTok famous. And he just recently bought a place in Studio City. And as much as I convinced him not to do this, he just wants it done. So every single room is completely different. The living room is in half. Half of it is different. The other half is different. The kitchen half is different. The other half is different. It's all for their TikTok videos. And literally every, I would say every six inches, we had to put an LED ring light on all of the insert of the walls because who knows where he's going to do his TikTok. And this person makes a lot of money, like a lot of money. So that this is what I've been seeing, at least for myself and that particular client, is that the, that matters because it's his business, right? That's how he makes his money. So we have to really be creative and also <laughs> swallow your pride because as much as I say, no one's going to buy this home, you know, this place, it, he doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It's yeah. like a theater set, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it looks like a circus. Like but, moving you know, walls and props. It, yeah. Like tastefully done. There's a stage. Sure. There's a stage that turns like. <laughs> it, of course there is. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So. Amazing. Um, so with that, we have, we have pretty much come full circle and I, I cannot tell you, um, Michelle, Sherry, Jason, how much I appreciate you and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, this is, this is always fun for me and I have missed you guys so much. And these kind of, you know, it, it kind of feels like we're, we're still, we're still close enough and in touch. So I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Um, this is the wellness and design thought leadership series for Combo by Design presented by Thermosol. If you have any questions about these designers and you want to know more about them and, and follow along, check the show notes. There will be a link to their websites so you can go see the amazing work that they do. And again, thank you guys for doing this. This was amazing. I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Shiri, Jason, and Michelle. Thank you, Walker Zanger and Thermosol for your support and uh, partnership. And thank you for listening. Without you, there is no joy in doing this. You are greatly appreciated. And my hope is to bring you inspiration and sublime design through these conversations, to give you that extra push to be the most creative designer you can possibly be. And I think we did that here. Please make sure you are subscribing to the show so you don't miss a single episode. You can find us everywhere you find your favorite podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Convo by Design with an X and ConvoByDesign.com. Be well, and remember to take today first. Mm-hmm.